you have your Bible, I'm going to ask that you go ahead and start turning to the book of Ephesians. We'll be looking at Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22, excuse me, 22 through 33. We've got a lot of ground to cover today. And I will tell you, as I mentioned last week, I am somewhat hesitant uh, to speak on this matter today, mainly because uh, it's one of the situations in the scriptures that I am not personally familiar with uh, by way of experience. But we're going to be looking at the relationship between a husband and a wife. And as I uh, prepared this message, I kept being reminded of, of many great truths, but one of the greatest comforts to me is knowing that the writer of this text was a bachelor himself. So I get comfort from that knowing that if Paul is able to speak on it, I think I should be comfortable in speaking on it as well. As though I don't have experience myself, I do know that the scripture is clear in regards to the relationship between a husband and a wife. Now for those of you like myself who are not married, you might say, well, I'm just gonna tune out. This sermon's not for me. Uh, But I, I will say, There is quite obviously correlations here that Paul uses to non-married people as well. Uh, And and we'll see that in regards to how he compares the church to Jesus Christ uh, and how he he points to Jesus Christ's love for the church. So just because you're not married, do not think that, well, you can just tune into uh, your daydreams or things like that. There is great information here for even those who are unmarried. Now with that in mind, Ephesians chapter 5 verses 22 through 33, we see Paul write these words. He says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So here we have Paul's instruction on the relationship between the wife and the husband, and between Christ and the church how they in many ways are to parallel one another, that we are to yield ourselves to Christ as the wife submits herself to her husband. And we are to understand that Christ has loved us with a sacrificial love, a love that we ought to emulate in our own daily lives as Christ sacrificed himself and died on the cross for our sins. Now, as we look to the text that may cause the most confrontation, especially in the the day and age in which we live. Now I say that knowing that there's nothing new under the sun. This first verse, 22, has caused much difficulty in study, I believe, because there is much confusion as to what this looks like. But in verse 22, we see Paul say, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now that term submit it's a very unique term. It, it, it actually comes from a military mindset. It's often used in the Greek language by uh, military 
usage in regards to a soldier yielding to a general or a soldier yielding to a superior. Uh, and the idea here is not just obey, and that's something I want us to make very clear here. You see in chapter 6, it starts out in Ephesians that children are to obey their parents. Slaves are to obey their masters. That term is very much so different from the term submit. They're two different Greek words. When Paul says wives submit, he's not just saying you obey. Every single thing that the husband says, you have to do. That's not what Paul's saying here. He's saying we are to understand that the relationship between man and wife is one in which the wife willingly and lovingly says that she will submit to the authority of her husband in regards to the unit of the family, recognizing that he is the leader of the family unit, that God in his infinite wisdom has set a plan in place that men would be the leaders of the household, that they would be the ones who would hopefully take initiative and hopefully be the ones who would provide for their family. Now, in one of the next slides, I have the Greek word here. It's, it's hippotasso, and it has two major meanings. It means to arrange oneself under another's authority or to yield to one's admonition or advice. And when Paul says that a wife is to submit to her husband, I believe that what he's ultimately saying is not you do every single thing that the, the husband says, you don't make any decisions by no means, is that what Paul is saying. I believe that Paul elsewhere in scripture makes it clear that husbands and wives ought to work together well as one unit. We see he talks about later on, as we'll see in a moment, that the husband and wife are one flesh. They are one unit. They're not two parties anymore competing. They are one seeking to do that which glorifies God. I love how uh, David Platt, he's a pastor just down the way over in Tyson's actually, uh, he puts it this way, that God made it clear from the start that men and women are equal in dignity, value, and worth. Submission is not about denigrating the value of another's life. Instead, the biblical word means to yield to another in love, meaning the wife loves her husband to the extent that she's willing to allow him to lead her, willing to allow God to use him as the leader of the family unit. In no way does scripture say that women are lesser creatures in regards to value. God values men and women equally. He loves men and women with equal worth. He does not say men are more important. He does not say women are less valuable. He says we are equal in importance. However, we have different roles to fulfill. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 27 through 28, talk about that reality with Christ himself. I want you to consider this. Christ is king. We understand he has all authority. It's been given to him by his heavenly father. But in 1 Corinthians 15, listen to how Paul describes the relationship between Jesus Christ the Son and God the Father. Paul says in verse 27, For he, speaking of God the Father, God the Father hath put all things under his, Jesus Christ's feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is expected, which did put all things under him. Now look at verse 28. This is important. You see is where verse 27 says, God the Father put all things under Jesus Christ's feet, so he's given him all authority. Verse 28 says, And when all things shall be subdued unto, the, unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all and in all. So Paul is saying Jesus and God, the Father, they are equal. And we understand this to be a basic teaching of the scriptures, the Trinity of God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are all equally God. There is not one uh, person in the Trinity who is less 
We don't believe that the Holy Spirit has less power than the Father or that Christ is a little bit lower than the Father. They are all equally God and all equally uh, one. But even as they are equal, Scripture says Jesus will subject himself unto the Father. He will yield himself unto the Father. Jesus elsewhere in the Scriptures, I believe it's in the Gospel of Luke, when he is, you may be familiar with the story in which Christ goes missing for a few days and he is at the temple and he's teaching and Mary and Joseph are looking for him. In that text we see that the same word or wordage is used here as wives submitting. That it says Jesus submitted himself to his parents. He yielded himself. Now, Jesus and the Father are equal in value, yet Jesus submits himself. So for us to see the wife being called to submit is in no way saying that she is lesser in value. I love how Wayne Grudem puts it, the commentary, and he says, Just as God the Father has authority over the Son, though the two are equal in deity, so in marriage the husband has authority over the wife though they are equal in personhood. And this is key here. They are equal in importance, yet different in role. They have equal, equality in importance, but their roles are very different. God created men and women to have different roles and to have different interests and have different characteristics. This is not a bad thing. We live in a world today that in many ways is seeking to rid the differences in roles in all types of situations. And I, I believe this is a dangerous area to tread. To say, uh, certainly I agree, we are all equal, no matter our sex, no matter our age, no matter what nationality we are. We are all equal as human beings. But we all have different roles to play. We all have different characteristics. We are all unique in that regard. In fact, if you look back to the beginning in Genesis chapter 3, God gives us the role that is to be that of the husband. The role of the husband is found in Genesis 3.16. God, this is after the fall of both Adam and Eve. Verse 16, God says unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. He gives the rule of the household to the man. And I know this can be deemed as sexist, but I pray that you don't take it that way. Because God has a role for the family unit that the man would take initiative and seek to lead and seek to be a shepherd to that which God has blessed him with. And that the wife <clears throat> would yield herself and submit. Now to do such is very important. Like I said earlier, it's not to just follow every command. To yield oneself and to submit oneself to their own husband. I believe is to merely recognize the authority God has given him in the family unit and to support him, to seek to ease his burden, to seek to be a comfort to him. Genesis 2, a chapter just previous to this, verse 18, when God created man and woman, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 18 says this, and the Lord God said, it is not good that man should live alone or be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for him. Now he's speaking of, of uh, an aid, a comfort, one who supports and helps. He's speaking of the woman. Eve would be a support to her husband. She would be a help. Joseph Exel in his commentary says that the woman is to be a help and not a hindrance. Not the governor, but a help in government to ease him in part of his burden. 
and cares and help in every way. I love that we see that the woman and the wife is to be a supporter. She's to be a loving and an honoring individual who yields to her husband in the way that is seen as that she takes his leadership seriously. She doesn't seek to implement her own will over his, but she yields herself and recognizes that God has a role for her husband to play. Now, like I mentioned earlier, it's not just doing every single thing. Now, in verses 23 and 24 of Ephesians 5, we see that the end of verse 24 ends in a way that might be contrary to that. You might think, well, how can it be read as any other way? Ephesians 23 through 24, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands. Now, the word here is in everything. But we have to remember, verse 22 says, the wives are to submit to their husband as unto the Lord. That's the important key. Because a a husband in saying, I want you to do this, if it is contrary to what God's word says, then you're not obliged to do so. You're to yield unto your husband as so far as it pleases and honors God. This is to be important here. Now, for those who are not married, what I believe we can take from this, especially verses 23 and 24, is Christ is the head of the church, just as the husband is to be the head of the wife. Christ is that to whom all of us are to subject ourselves to. We might have a will that is contrary to that which God would have of us. Our sinful nature may want us to seek after that which is self-pleasing and self-seeking. But as Christ, as the head of the church, we have to submit ourselves and subject ourselves to his will, not our own, and know that his will is that which we are to seek after and to support one another as bodies of Christ or the body of Christ. We ought to therefore subject ourselves to Christ himself. He is our head. He is our husband or bridegroom. The scripture continuously alludes to the reality that the church of Jesus Christ is his bride, that we are his bride. And we ought to therefore seek to yield ourselves to him, knowing that he is our head. He leads us in every way. Let us therefore take this understanding. Now, as we continue on in this text, as husbands are the head of the family unit in the scriptural role, husbands, when you you might be tempted to just read verses 22 through 24 and say, I've got things made. But that's not what we ought to take from this. The wife is to submit to her husband's leadership, but the husband has a great responsibility to lead in a loving and gentle way. Husbands, you are to, as verse 25 through 27 says, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. And I'm going to pause there. Consider how much Jesus Christ loves you and I. Consider how sacrificial Christ has been for you and I. In fact, Paul continues on, and gave himself for it. Verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now, if we backtrack, if you look at verse 25, uh, the word used here in husbands, love your wives, it's a very important text that we find. The term love comes from the Greek agapao, or uh, as many of you may refer to it as agape, And there are many types of love in the Greek language. You may be familiar with uh, the eros 
love. That is a very romantic love or a sensual love almost. There's the phileo love. Uh, we call Philadelphia, we call it that because it, it's a Greek term. It's two actually Greek words. Phileo meaning uh, love, uh, basically brotherly love, a, a familial love. That's another type of love. But the love of agape is very important. Many times, yes, it is used as a universal love, but almost always when it refers to God and his love for us or Christ, it's talking about a love that is sacrificial. And I think that ultimately we have to say that isn't that exactly what love is? Is a sacrificial love, a love that is willing to put something or someone else before another? Paul talks about husbands loving their wives, but he says so in a way that reminds us that our love for wives, or husbands' loves for wives, ought to be a sacrificial love, a love that is not self-seeking. You heard earlier the scriptural reading from 1 Corinthians, where Paul talks about how love is not self-serving. Love is patient. Love is kind. You often will hear that scripture reference at, at weddings and things of that type of nature. But love certainly is to be sacrificial. Paul in verse 2 of chapter 5 says it this way. Ephesians 5, 2, Paul commands the church. He has just said, be imitators of God. And he says, walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. The same term there, agape, and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Just as Christ laid down his life for the church, husbands, we must understand that this is a call for you to be sacrificial in your love for your wife, to lay down your will and your wants, and to understand that you are to love your wife with a gracious love, a sacrificial love, a love that is willing to make sacrifices. And that can be difficult at times, but it is certainly the call that husbands have. Interestingly, I love how Paul goes back to Genesis once more. If you look at verses 28 through 31, he says something that may sound familiar because it is certainly from Genesis as well. Five, Ephesians 5, 28 through 31. Paul says, So ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord of, to the church. And here's where he says that statement that is, very reminiscent of the teaching in Genesis. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. As the husband is to love his wife sacrificially, the husband is to understand that they are now one flesh. I want to ask almost a rhetorical question, but how much do you love yourself? Some of you might be saying, well, not much. <laughs> uh, I, I, I wish I could improve in this area. I, I hate this part of my life, so on and so forth. Maybe a better question is, how much do you think about yourself? And you might initially say, well, not at all. I hardly think about myself. It's very almost subconscious. We think about our wants, our needs, very much so throughout the day. If you were to stop and pause and, and every time you thought about something regarding yourself, it would almost be the entirety of the amount of time you're awake. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Certainly we should think of the needs of others, but we are all individuals. We all have our own perspective of the world. We all have our own soul, our own mind. We think about ourselves a lot. We do things for ourselves a lot, whether we realize it or not. 
You go to work, yes, to provide for yourself, to provide for others. You go out perhaps and mow the lawn. Well, who's that for? That's, yeah, you might say it's for your neighbors, uh, but it's for you. You go to the store to shop. It's typically for yourself. We think about ourselves. We love ourselves a lot. Men, husbands, love your wife as you love yourself. This is very reminiscent of Jesus' teaching of that we are to love others as we love ourselves as well. We are to show a compassionate love, a sacrificial love, a love that is willing to move mountains. Now in Genesis 2, we see that Jesus, uh, not Jesus, but the, the words here are pointing to the teachings of Christ and the teachings of Paul, but God's plan for man and wife is that if they would come together as one body. And being one body, they are to move as a unit. They are in unison. They are together as one. Genesis 2, 21 through 23. The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, I love what Adam says. This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. One of my favorite quotes that I, uh, in preparing for this, I've been preparing for this for a while and I still have a lot to learn. By no means am I saying that I'm settled in all this. I may learn much in years to come. But one of my favorite quotes in studying this particular text was from Matthew Henry. And he says these words. The woman was made out of Adam's side. She was not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, yet under his arm to be protected and near his heart to be loved. I found that to be just so beautiful, that thought that God took the rib of Adam, creating the woman. He could have used any part of that body, and yet it was something close to the heart, something that would be protected. This is the type of love husbands are to have for their wives. Now, there is much more that could be said on this, but I will say by no means am I an expert. And where I find myself currently in life, I want to end with one last passage of scripture. That's verse 33 of Ephesians 5. We ought to understand that marriage is meant to be God-honoring and self-sacrificing. Both man and wife, both husband and wife are to love each other and to be sacrificial in that love. But Paul ends this particular text by saying, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Love one another. My prayer for those who are married is that you take this to heart. Now I want to speak for just a moment to those of you who are like myself, unmarried. Christ loved you with a sacrificial love. And not, I'm not saying Christ doesn't love married people uh, by any means. You're included in this, but I want to uh, take a moment just for those who do not fit these categories. Christ loves you with an everlasting love, a love that is sacrificial, a love that laid down his own life. Paul in Romans 5 tells us that while we were yet enemies of God, and I want you to think about that, not close to God, not righteous, while we were enemies of God. You and I may forget from time to time that that's who we were before Christ entered in. We were his enemies. You might not have been outwardly evil by the standards of the world, but by the standards of the word of God and by his law, all of us had fallen short. We were all his enemies. 
yet he willingly laid down his life. He sacrificed himself. And he calls us now as his bride to yield ourselves to him, to be subject to him, to submit our will to his, and to live in a way that reflects well on him. My prayer for us is that we take this to heart, that God has sacrificed himself by becoming a servant and being obedient unto death on the cross. Help, Lord, help us to be subject to him and to you, Lord. We ask these things. With that, let us go to the Lord once more.